Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with Mark Stryker, presented by University of Michigan Press. We'll be uh, watching for audience questions throughout the event. If you're on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of the screen. If you're watching on Facebook, please let us know your question in a comment. You can turn captions on or off using the live transcript button in Zoom at the bottom right side of the screen. And we'll be recording the event this evening, and we'll share it on Facebook later this week. Tonight, I'm very happy to introduce Mark Stryker. Mark is a Detroit-based author, journalist, and critic who specializes in jazz, classical music, and the visual arts. His first book, Jazz from Detroit, was published in 2019 and named a Jazz Book of the Year by the Jazz Times Critics Poll and Jazz Journalists Association Awards. It later received laudatory reviews and coverage in a dozen international media outlets, including being featured on NPR's Fresh Air. A 2020 inductee into the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame, Mark spent 21 years as an arts reporter and critic at the Detroit Free Press, winning a dozen national reporting and writing awards. He received a Kresge Artist Fellowship in 2012. He is also the author of Destiny, 100 Years of Music, Magic, and Community at Orchestra Hall in Detroit, published in 2019 by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Mark is currently a columnist for Jazz Times Magazine and is co-producing a documentary film inspired by Jazz from Detroit. He has also worked professionally as a jazz saxophonist. The book I've mentioned a handful of times already, Jazz from Detroit, explores the city's pivotal role in shaping the course of modern and contemporary jazz. With more than two dozen in-depth profiles of remarkable Detroit-bred musicians, Mark makes Detroit jazz come alive while drawing out significant connections between the players eras, styles, and Detroit's distinctive history. The book starts in the 1940s and 50s when the auto industry created a thriving black working middle class in Detroit that supported a vibrant nightlife and exceptional public school music programs and mentors, transforming the city into a jazz juggernaut. This golden age nurtured many legendary, legendary musicians, Hank, Thad, and Elvin Jones, Gerald Wilson, Milt Jackson, and many others. As the city's fortunes change, Mark turns, Mark turns his book spotlight toward often overlooked but prescient musician-run cooperatives and self-determination groups of the 1960s and 70s, such as the Strata Corporation and Tribe. In more recent decades, the city's culture of mentorship has ensured that Detroit continued to incubate world-class talent who would help define contemporary jazz. The resilience of Detroit's jazz tradition provides a powerful symbol of the city's lasting cultural influence. Mark, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Shortly before the 2007 Detroit Jazz Festival, local aficionados were consumed by a rumor that Youssef Latif was going to play the blues when the 86-year-old legend returned home to perform. The blues was meant literally as a 12-bar musical form and as a metaphor for the fundamental modern jazz that the tenor saxophonist, flutist, and oboist used to play back in the day. It had been a long time since Detroiters or anyone had heard this kind of music from Latif. For decades, he had been exploring a multi-ethnic idiom of earthy rhythm, exotic texture, and open form. He had also been writing notated classical music and veering off into poetry and visual art. Latif, tall and thick across the chest, wore a purple dashiki at the festival. He fronted a traditional rhythm section of piano, bass, and drums, but the landscape for improvisation uh, remained largely Pan-African, Middle Eastern, and Asian. Halfway through the set, however, Latif picked up his oboe and blew several 12-bar blues choruses at a walking tempo that were filled with bent pitch, quavering vibrato, and down-home soul. The audience took to it like ice cream. Well, that was Youssef Latif, uh, and I read a little bit there from uh, from the book, the chapter about Youssef, and um, and then we heard him play in uh, 1961 with an all Detroit band. Barry Harris was the pianist, uh, the bassist was Herman Wright, the drummer uh, Elvin Jones. I always like to start these uh, these talks with the music because really that's what it's all about, and um, and uh, I like to put just put us in the right frame of mind. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, U of M Press and uh, and Scott in particular, in particular for uh, inviting me to chat tonight. Um, and uh, thank you all out there for uh, coming to hear me uh, and uh, sharing some music with me. 
Um, I'm going to speak for, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so um, uh, about the book, and then I'm going to read a little bit and hear a little more music, and then uh, we'll have some questions, and um, and that'll be a nice hour with, with all of you. Um, my book uh, really makes the case that you can't tell the history of jazz uh, in America without also telling the history of jazz from Detroit. Um, these are indivisible stories. Um, Detroit has been one of the uh, primary feeders of uh, jazz talent to the national jazz scene from uh, the middle of the 20th century uh, until the present day. Uh, we've produced uh, innovators like Milt Jackson, Elvin Jones, Thad Jones, Ron Carter, Joe Henderson, Jerry Allen. Uh, we've produced major stylists, uh, Donald Byrd, Curtis Fuller, Charles McPherson, Barry Harris. Uh, we've produced countless foot soldiers um, to the national scene. Uh, Detroiters have made important contributions to pretty much every style since 1945. Bebop, hard bop, post bop, uh, fusion. Uh, today's uh, 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 contemporary mainstream, progressive currents, uh, the avant-garde, uh, hip-hop hybrids, Detroiters are, are in the thick of all of that music. Um, we've produced two of the greatest teachers uh, that that uh, that this music has ever seen. The pianist Barry Harris, who was active here in Detroit until the 1950 in the 1950s, and uh, uh, just died a, a year ago, as a matter of fact, still teaching in New York at the age of 91. Uh, and Marcus Belgrave, the great trumpeter, who in recent decades sort of inherited this mantle as a, a mentor in chief uh, in Detroit, and it's a very important part of our story that we'll, we'll that, that I talk about in the book. Um, Especially from uh, 1956 to about 1970, uh, you can't pick up a record that was made on the East Coast uh, and not run into one, two, three, sometimes four or more uh, Detroiters. Uh, but here's something that's really interesting and really critical, and that is that lots of cities um, had golden ages of jazz uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, uh, in St. Louis, in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, in Indianapolis, uh, uh, and and the like, uh, and yet they all die out. Um, Cleveland is another example, um, big at mid-century, and then it all kind of uh, goes away. Detroit, uh, however, even as our population uh, sharply declined and the city lost economic, uh, economic power and goes into this sort of, you know, 50-year decline, we keep producing major league uh, jazz talent, sort of punching way above our weight class. We, um, we continue uh, as say uh, Chicago or Philadelphia uh, uh, and and kept uh, producing a uh, world-class jazz musician. So, you know, the question is how did that happen? Uh, what were the social, economic, cultural factors uh, uh, that led to this mid-century explosion of jazz in Detroit uh, and then sustained it uh, over so many decades. Uh, what happened in Detroit uh, is not an accident. Um, it is the uh, result of a specific um, uh, cultural, economic, social factors uh, and specific people all coming together. Um, it's a multi-layered story. Um, and I'll give you a quick summary, and then I'll come back and talk about a few of these things uh, uh, more in depth. Uh, but the first thing is that the Great Migration uh, brought hundreds of thousands of African Americans uh, to Detroit in the first uh, half of the 20th century, uh, you know, in search of uh, less overt racism, economic opportunities, escaping the racial violence uh, in the South. Um, the rise of the auto industry helped create a large black working uh, and middle class, and that created a vibrant black nightlife. Detroit is on the front edge of creating a black working and middle class uh, in the United States because of the auto industry, and that creates an economic uh, self-sufficient African-American uh, population in Detroit that is unique uh, across the country. Um, we have exceptional uh, music education in the schools here, uh, had exceptional music education in the schools here from the 1920s, uh, all the way up until very early in this uh, 21st century. Very important part of the story, particularly at mid-century. Um, we had very important mentors in the community. I mentioned them earlier, Barry Harris, who taught everyone in the 1950s, um, and uh, then Marcus Be Belgrave uh, later on. 
Um, and so this combination of a formal education in the schools, uh, the informal education that people got on the street from mentors like people like Barry Harris, all of that happening with a thriving within the context of this thriving African American nightlife, clubs, you know, bars, live music, all of that. That's a very powerful combination of elements um, in the middle of the 20th century that is unique uh, uh, in the country in many ways. Um, and there were other things. Um, we have very high standards in Detroit. Pepper Adams, the great baritone saxophonist, um, used to say that when he was growing up here in Detroit in the 50s, he thought that everybody played with good time and good rhythm. Um, and it wasn't until he left Detroit and, and began to experience other scenes and other musicians from other places that he realized that that wasn't true. Not everybody played with good time. They just all played with good time in Detroit. Um, we had very hip audience uh, uh, audiences, uh, very knowledgeable, very supportive. They knew the difference between people that were really making it and people that were kind of shucking and jiving. Um, Joe Henderson, great uh, tenor saxophonist, um, came up here in the 1950s, became a major influence in the 1960s, uh, uh, said to me once that you had to really have your stuff together. Detroit had the best audiences. Um, the audiences around Detroit were like musicians. They knew. No way to come up on that bandstand jiving. That could be injurious to one's ego. <laughs> and we have big city competitiveness here, high expectations that sharpened the raw talent. But there was a small town warmth, too, that kind of nurtured it. Uh, and Alvin Jones, the drummer who we heard on that opening track, who then later became very famous with uh, the John Coltrane Quartet, uh, he talked about uh, audiences at a place in Detroit called the World Stage in the 1950s. And he said, um, you know, he compared those audiences to Carnegie Hall. He said it was a whole community actively participating in the of this art sense uh, unity and the audience and that feedback loop that happens between the musicians uh, and the culture of the city um, really elevate um, uh, the music. Uh, and so the result of all of this is that by the 1950s, uh, musicians are rolling off what I like to think of as like an assembly line here. Uh, they're all part of a unified fleet of Detroit jazz musicians, and yet each one is a one of a kind individualist, um, a Donald Byrd, a Curtis Fuller, a Tommy Flanagan, a Kenny Burrell, and et cetera. So I want to back up a little bit and do a little bit more um, history. Um, you know, jazz and Detroit grew up together in the first half of the 20th century. Um, 1900, uh, Detroit is the 13th largest city in the country. It's got a population of about 285,000, quite a provincial place. Um, 1900, um, Detroit manufacturers are making about 500 cars a year, okay? Move ahead to 1920, 20 years later, Detroit is now making 1.5 million cars, and we are now the fourth largest city in the country with uh, uh, a million people. Um, and an increasing number of those people are Black. Um, you know, by the early 1950s, when Detroit's population peaks at almost 2 million, uh, about 300,000 or more of those citizens are African American. Um, the auto industry, is uh, uh, providing this, you know, creating this growing uh, working and middle class that's creating opportunities for business owners, black lawyers, black doctors, all of that creates Paradise Valley, which is our entertainment district. Uh, if you know Detroit, the area right where the sports stadiums are, where Ford Field is, that's the heart of the, tr the historic African American uh, entertainment and, uh, uh, um, you know, the center of, of, of black economic life in Detroit, Paradise Valley. Um, and jazz is an expression of African American culture. It's a it's a music of cultural affirmation, uh, a music of uh, that says uh, um, it's a way of saying who we are. It's an optimistic music. It's about um, a music for people who have decided to feel good in spite of conditions. Uh, and it's a music of improvisation, of adapting one's life to ever shifting uh, conditions. Um, and that is uh, that is the black experience in in America. And jazz finds a home in cities with large and economically thriving uh, uh, African American residents. And that's what's happening in the first half of the 20th century. Music is omnipresent in black communities in schools, barbershops, churches, backyards, community centers, blues, gospel, jazz, hymns, uh, classical music is in the mix. Uh, music is seeping out of doors and windows, sort of just settling on the street kind of like in coating the 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 neighborhoods in this thick haze of blues and and swing 
Um, Yusef Latif, who we heard at the beginning there playing the oboe, lived above a theater on Hastings Street, right through the heart of um, Paradise Valley and Black Bottom, the, the, um, uh, the African-American neighborhoods. And he, um, he would go down and sit in the theater uh, right below his house and soak up the sounds of the big bands. That's how he heard Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins and Chew Berry, basically, in his living room. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, it's a very vibrant scene. Um, and in the middle of the century, uh, we have another economic growth spurt because of World War II, powered by the arsenal of democracy. Our auto factories change over into um, uh, creating war munitions. Um, so there's a lot of money flowing, three shifts, of, three worker shifts a day, um, a lot of bars, a lot of restaurants, a lot of hotels. Um, and the music is changing at this period. We're moving um, from the swing era and the big bands into uh, modern jazz, um, uh, uh, bebop, as it's called, is germinating on the East Coast. And it's a, a more complex music, new levels of uh, rhythmic and harmonic invention. It's a virtuoso music. Um, and it demanded new kinds of technical expertise. And Detroit is an early adapter. We we nurture many first uh, important first generation bebop players: Milt Jackson, the vibraphonist; Wardell Gray, a tenor saxophonist; Teddy Edwards, a tenor player; uh, Howard McGee, trumpet player; Lucky Thompson, a tenor player. All of these players, all these musicians, are sort of first generation bebop players. Um, and the question is, well, why were we so quick in Detroit to pick up on this music? And one of the main reasons is that our musicians had the skills to play this new complicated music. And that brings us back to the schools. We had great music education uh, in the schools and our schools in Detroit were integrated. So even though there were um, you know, housing pressures and house, lots of housing discrimination and redlining and segregation in many aspects of most aspects actually in Detroit life, but the schools were in fact integrated and that meant black kids got the same opportunities as white kids as some of the flagship schools like Cass Tech, for instance, Porton High School that we'll talk about. Um, the schools in Detroit were recognized from the 1920s as having good music programs. Uh, elementary students had specialists three or four times a week. Kids started their instruments in the third grade. Um, you know, even at Miller High School, which was in the historically black neighborhood of Black Bottom, which had to cope with inferior facilities, was a uh, was an uh, a center of academic and musical excellence. Uh, Kenny Burrell, the great guitarist. Uh, played guitar in a stage band there, played percussion in the concert band, studied bass with the Mexican-American uh, band director named Louis Cabrera, who challenged him to write arrangements, stayed after school to teach him theory. Um, and Kenny told me that when he got to Wayne State, he didn't have to do homework for two years because of the education that he got from Louis Cabrera. Um, at Cass Tech, uh, which was basically what we would think of as an arts magnet school, um, kids who were majoring in music studied um, theory, history, rigorous music education. Uh, if you played a, uh, they all had piano instructions. If you had, if you played a string instrument, you had to learn how to play a wind instrument. And that's why Ron Carter, the great bass player who comes to fame with Miles Davis in the 1960s and is now the most recorded bassist in jazz history. That's why when Ron was in school at, at Cass Tech, yeah, he played cello and then bass in the in the orchestra, but he also played uh, alto clarinet in the uh, in the concert band because he had to learn a wind instrument. Um, Gerald Wilson, a very important uh, composer arranger um, in the early bebop years, uh, told me he learned everything he needed to know about harmony at Cass Tech. In fact, band leaders used to recruit at Cass. They would come into um, uh, uh, they come in Detroit. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Basie band, the Lunsford band, Jimmy Lunsford band, Duke Ellington, uh, Andy Kirk, uh, Lionel Hampton, and they would play in Paradise Valley. And during the day, those leaders would often go over to Cass Tech to scout talent um, and to hear the, who, who was playing well. And that's how Jimmy Lunsford first learned of Cass Tech, uh, learned of rather of, um, of Gerald Wilson. And when, uh, um, uh, Lunsford needed a trumpet player. He was in Ohio, needed a trumpet player. Uh, in 1939, he wired for that kid that he remembered from Cass Tech, and that's what launches uh, Gerald Wilson on a 60-year uh, uh, influential career. Um, so, in fact, uh, one of the one of the themes of my book, subtle themes of the book, is that uh, if you invest in public school music education, you can change the world. And uh, and we know that uh, because that's what we did in Detroit. 
Um, and it wasn't just all these jazz musicians coming out of Detroit. Um, all the Motown uh, uh, musicians, uh, the the producers, the backline people, Barry Gordy himself, uh, you know, came out of the Detroit public schools. Um, the, the orchestras all across the country, uh, even to this day, have uh, cast tech uh, graduates uh, in the, in their ranks. Um, the role of the public schools was was critical, but so was the education from people in the on the street and the mentors. And that brings us to Barry Harris, uh, uh, the professor of bebop, as I call him in um, in the book. Um, Barry was born in 1929, and um, you know by uh, uh, by 1950. Um, he is already beginning to take a leadership role in the community, even though he's just a couple of years older than some of his uh, prize students. Um, he basically starts running this uh, Socratic workshop in his house every day, and people would come over and Barry would sit at the piano, he would teach people scales and chords and theory and, and songs and began putting together a... Um, Kind of a unified field theory of of jazz harmony uh, that has now become very influential. You can go to a conservatory, music schools all across the country, and they're teaching a version of the Barry Harris method that he was creating uh, out of his uh, his own um, vibrant uh, intelligence and mind uh, in his house on the east side of Detroit. Um, Donald Byrd, the great trumpet player, Paul Chambers, the bass player, Doug Watkins, the bass player, Yusef Latif, even though Yusef was older. All of these folks studied with Barry Curtis Fuller, the trombonist, Pepper Adams, uh, the baritone saxophone player, used to call him Uncle Barry, um, countless others. Um, when Sonny Rollins uh, or John Coltrane or Cannonball Adderley, stars like that would come into De Detroit to play, they would always go over to Barry's house and see what the maestro was, was teaching. John Coltrane would pull up a chair and he would say, well, what are you teaching these young folks, uh, Barry? And he would then, and, and so you can hear snippets of Barry's method in their playing as well. Um, and... Uh, um, there are another a couple of other things that are important about Barry, one of which is Detroit had such an active scene. The clubs were so vibrant in the 1950s. There was so much work that Barry didn't have to leave. He could stay in Detroit and play with visiting guest artists coming into town, Lester Young or uh, Sarah Vaughn or Billy Holly or, you know, people like that that would come in and would need rhythm sections. Barry would play piano for them. Uh, he worked his own gigs. And so Barry doesn't leave for New York until 1960. So because he's basically teaching for 1950 to 1960 in Detroit, he's creating multiple generations um, and of, of, of uh, protégés. Uh, and that really emphasizes his uh, um, the importance and magnifies his influence. Um, and the other thing that's so interesting about Barry uh, is that uh, the lessons were not all musical. Uh, Charles McPherson is a great alto saxophonist, uh, uh, still working. In fact, Charles is playing at the Detroit Jazz Festival coming up this weekend on Sunday evening. Um, Charles uh, used to hang out, was one of these kids that would hang out in front of the Bluebird, which was the, uh, the epicenter of modern jazz in Detroit on the west side and where, where Barry played. And um, Charles would hang out outside the club and, and Barry would see these kids and he began talking to them, saw that they were interested and began inviting them over to his house to take less, you know, these, these lessons. And um, as I said, the, the lessons were not always musical. One day Charles was over at his house, at Barry's house, and um, he had his report card. It was report card day, and Charles, or, I'm sorry, and Barry said, um, I see you have your report card. Can I take a look at it? And so Barry, or Charles rather, gives it to Barry, and he's looking and sort of gets a stern look on his face, and he looks back at Charles, and he says, well, I see they're all C's here. And Charles kind of very flippantly says, well, yeah, I guess I'm just average. And uh, Barry lit into him. He said, look, man, you cannot be average and play this music that you want to play. Your heroes, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, these are not average men. If you want to play this music, you're going to have to tighten it up up here. And, uh, you know, Charles, uh, that talk changed his life. Uh, Charles began to read, <laughs> made the honor roll. His teachers couldn't believe his grades. They'd be passing out the test scores and they'd be surprised that, you know, Charles had an A. Um, and if you talk to Charles today, he's very worldly, um, a very well-read intellectual man, and all of that traces itself back to um, to Barry. So it's a it's a really um, uh, really very significant um, uh, role that Barry plays in in um, 
uh, creating uh, what we think of as Detroit jazz. Um, and uh, I think what I'll do here is just take a few minutes um, and jump ahead very quickly and just say that that culture of mentorship remains in place today. And over the last 45 years, up until his death uh, about six, seven years ago, uh, Marcus Belgrave, the trumpet player, who had um, uh, you know, inherited this mantle as you know, mentor in chief. And and uh, uh, Marcus was not born in Detroit. Uh, he was born in Pennsylvania, but he comes to fame uh, with the Ray Charles band, the first great uh, Ray Charles band in the 1950s. He's with Ray from 58 to 63. Um, and he's looking to get off the road in 1963 and he hits on coming to Detroit. And why does he come to Detroit? Well, two reasons. One, he knows about the great history here and particularly uh, the trumpet players, Thad Jones and Donald Byrd, who are heroes of his. And he wants to go where those guys came from. Uh, and the other reason is he knows that he can get work in the Motown studios doing studio work. Um, and so he comes here in 1963, and by 1970, he's beginning to teach. And there's a whole section in my book called Marcus Belgrave and His Children. And his children uh, are all the great jazz musicians that sort of came up here in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. So people like uh, Regina Carter, the violinist, and Bob Hurst, the bassist, who teaches at the University of Michigan, the late Jerry Allen, the pianist, who used to teach at the University of Michigan, uh, Rodney Whitaker, the bassist, uh, James Carter, the saxophonist, uh, um, all of these folks uh, and others all came up uh, under Marcus's wing. And um, and Marcus essentially would adopt these kids and, and started taking them on gigs. He would bring them over to his house for rehearsals. I'll tell you one quick story about that and then we'll, um, and how that worked, and then we'll uh, move on to the next thing. But um, Bob Hurst is a bass player, he's 15 years old. Bob was born in Detroit, family moved to the suburbs there at Rock and Marcus goes out to do a clue with uh, the band out there and Bob is 15 years old and Bob comes up to him during the day and says to Marcus hey would it be okay if you and I played a duet on the concert tonight now it's a very precocious thing for a bass player to say to a trumpet player who he's never met can we play a duet on the concert but Marcus saw the interest and said sure what would you like to play and Mark and Bob says well um, how about uh, confirmation now confirmation is a challenging song by um by Charlie Parker. So uh, they count it off and they begin to play and Bob uh, starts playing the melody in unison along with Marcus. Now it's a very tricky, fast, um, serpentine kind of melody, hard for any bass player of any age to play. For a 15 year old is to do that, not quite prodigy level, but it's getting there, it's real close. And Marcus was really taken aback by that. And he immediately at the concert went to Bob's parents and said, your kid is gifted. I'd like to work with him if that's okay. And so from that weekend on, that day on, every weekend, Bob's mother would schlep him an hour and a half down to Marcus's house in the city uh, every Saturday and Sunday, and then come and pick him up. Um, and Mark and Marcus, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Bob would hang out all day at Marcus's house. He would uh, rehearse, but he also got a chance to see how one lived a life as a musician and how you organize rehearsals and called people and dealt with the daily hassles of trying to um, make a living in this art form. And, you, you know, when you see stuff like that up close, it begins to give you a much bigger understanding of what's involved in being a jazz musician. And that story is repeated dozens of times with dozens of musicians. Um, you know, Regina Carter, the violinist said to me, this community raised us. This community raised us. You know, if there's a, if you're out on a gig, you, you're a Detroit jazz musician, you see a, some young kid that has talent, you immediately go to the parents and you say, hey, you know, do you, do you know about this summer program? Do you know about this? Uh, do you have an instrument? Can you afford one? You know, I know somebody, I think I can get your kid a free bass if we do the blah, blah, blah. That happens every day here. There's a culture here. The, the, the community, it takes a village, right? To, it takes a village to raise a jazz musician. And that's what we do all the time here. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna turn back to uh, the book uh, a little bit and read and hear a little bit more music and then we'll open it up for questioning okay so this is um uh, a little bit about milt jackson the great vibraphonist um and uh all right 
A critic once suggested that if the Detroit-born vibraphonist Milt Jackson ever played an unswinging phrase, he must have done so in private. But odds are that not even the woodshed heard Jackson trip over an awkward rhythm or improvise a melody that didn't bloom with lyricism or leave the scent of the blues hanging in the air. Jackson, who died in 1999 at age 76, was perhaps the most naturally swinging and soulful musician in jazz for decades. Timing is everything in jazz, and Jackson's control of rhythm was legendary. He created drama through relaxation and contrast. He'd strike notes behind the beat and then dart ahead, climbing over the top of the pulse before retreating to the backside of the beat. He personalized each note with its own articulation. Serpentine lines merged with repeated note triplet jabs that cut like a scalpel. The result was a charged forward momentum that still felt nonchalant. Jackson's improvisations at medium and fast tempos were ebullient outbursts of bebop melody, sly grace notes, witty triplets, and blues illusions that hung on his phrases like Christmas ornaments. His ballad shivered with eroticism. The sound he drew from the vibes pulsated with the warm vibrations of human feeling. Jackson wasn't just riffing on common, common forms when he played a 12-bar blues or a standard ballad. He was speaking from his heart, telling stories that reaffirmed the African-American aesthetics of jazz. The cultural critic Albert Murray might have said that Jackson transformed Negro experience into high style and offered heroic affirmation in the face of adversity. Vibraphonist Warren Wolf put it more colloquially when he told me, when Milt played the blues, it not only sounded good, it felt good, and it made you feel good too. So that was Milt Jackson playing the vibes. Uh, in 1952, uh, the tune was called True Blues, and that was essentially an, an early... Um, a version of uh, what became the modern jazz quartet. John Lewis on piano, uh, Percy Heath on bass, and uh, uh, Kenny Clark on drums. And um, so I see, I'm looking at the clock. We're on a, we're on a schedule here. So it's 740, and um, that is the time we have uh, decided we're going to turn it over to you all. Um, to um, to ask some questions. So the 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 only one other thing I would add here, um, it's not a coincidence that um, I started with a blues from Yusef Latif and I ended with a blues from uh, uh, Milt Jackson. Uh, the 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 core jazz tradition of blues, swing, and bebop is incredibly strong in Detroit. If you can't swing and you can't play the blues, you can't play in Detroit. You won't get anywhere. Uh, and those traditions. Um, uh, uh, run very, very deep. And, um, and so uh, uh, it's even our, even our avant-garde musicians in Detroit um, and our contemporary musicians who might be a long way, in some ways feel like they're moving a long way away from the tradition are always, always connected, always rooted here. Very important part of, uh, of uh, the tradition and the legacy here. Uh, in Detroit. So with that, I'll give it back to Scott and we can move to some questions, hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Mark. And, and everyone, please do submit your questions and we'll try to get to everything. Um, to start off with Mark, um, after playing the Milt Jackson piece, I, I kind of thought for people reading your book, um, what would what would you recommend for how, how they should hear some of the music discussed in the book? Do you have a particular playlist available or anything like that? Uh, in the book, uh, every chapter, every biographical chapter um, comes with, at the end, essentially, uh, three recommended recordings uh, by that artist. So, you know, with Milt, there'll be three, uh, uh, three LPs, that uh, CDs, uh, streaming, however you want to look at it, uh, three recordings uh, that, for me, sort of illustrate his, um, give you a nice overview. Uh, but, and that's, as I said, every chapter has, has those recommendations, but throughout the, the text of the book, um, I go, you know, fairly deep uh, on individual tracks, individual recordings. Uh, one of the things I really try and do is, is take readers and put them on the bandstand, you know, inside the group uh, to, to help people to illuminate uh, how the music is working and what is distinctive about these uh uh, uh, musicians and and so you'll see that 
a lot throughout the book. And uh, uh, many people have, have told me that they have uh, gotten, um, one of the ways they get the most out of the book is that they read uh, in proximity with their uh, phone or their computer. And so when I make a reference to some recording, if that sounds like something you want to hear right now, uh, you can do so. Uh, usually, I'm I'm sort of against the idea of taking you away from the page and into another medium. But I, I actually think, in that sense, um, uh, that works really well with the book. And I've also been told by people, um, in in sort of a tongue in cheek way, they sort of yell at me that I've cost them a lot of money because it's not just that you're going to end up buying the book, but you're going to end up buying the recordings that you hear and fall in love with. Uh, as you go through the book. I, on that topic of sort of taking readers to the bandstand, could you talk a little bit about uh, your process for actually researching and writing the book? How did you discover what it was like experiencing some of these performances? Um, so, you, you know, I grew up in this music. Um, I grew up as a jazz musician. I've been saturated with this music since I was uh, 11 years old. Um, and so, you know, sometimes people would say to me, um, would ask, well, how long did it take to write the book? Question authors get all the time. How long did it take? And I, I, I usually said, well, look, I was 56 years old when the book was published. So it took me 56 years <laughs> to write the book. Um, I, uh, when I sat down to work on these chapters, I had a whole history um, of of my uh, relationship with with these musicians. Um, some I knew better than others. Uh, but uh, to go directly to your question, uh, I started every uh, chapter uh, with a comprehensive listening to somebody's entire artistic output from the beginning of their career all the way to the end, tried to hear all the key recordings. Um, uh, both as a leader and as a sideman, I tried to, to, if there was stuff that I did not know well, I tried like hell to track it down so I could get, I mean, I really wanted to, part of what I was trying to do was create a canon uh, uh, for Detroit jazz and for each of these musicians. And so um, I, I tried to go through and, and the process of doing that, um, you know, puts you in the framework, you, you know, you know, you're now, sort of living in the world of say, Jerry Allen or Donald Byrd or whomever. And that music is sort of around in your ear. And um, that, that I mean, that's essentially um, what I did it was the process. And, and you know, you can't, um, I will say that um, the, the, the most challenging thing was um, two, two big challenging things. One was deciding how, who you had to leave out because there was not room to, to, to do uh, uh, chapters about everybody that deserved it. So that was one issue. Um, but the other um, was because I was writing biographical chapters, um, I didn't want the book to be uh, 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 fragmented. So here's this this guy, then this person, then this woman, then this guy. And, and, and for these things to feel disconnected, I really tried to create um, linkages so that there was a narrative flow from beginning to end. So the way it's structured tells a, a chronological and a thematic story. Uh, there are thematic chapters as well as the biographical chapters. Uh, there are uh, there are moments in in chapters that refer to other things in other chapters, so that um, so that you get a sense of a continuous evolving. A tradition that is ongoing even today as we speak and that was something that was important to me that this not be just all something that I was looking at history in retrospect that Detroit jazz legacy is an ongoing vibrant um, um, thing and I wanted that to be represented so you know there were some important people for I mean I could have written the entire book just focused on people that came of age here in the 1950s um, but I had to leave some of those people out so I could get to the important people that came up in the season, the present day as seen. So those are some of the things that, you know, sort of went into the process of writing. We have a uh, audience question. Um, someone hoping you could talk a little bit more about some of the Detroit jazz family dynasties, um, particularly some of the more unsung families like the Hendersons. Okay, so, um, 
I mean, first of all, the first thing to recognize here is that, um, and I'll come to the uh, the McKinney's and the Hendersons and others in a minute, but uh, Hank Jones, the pianist, the Thad Jones, the trumpet player and composer, and big band arranger, um, and Elvin Jones, the drummer, uh, those three brothers uh, born in, uh, um, um, uh, raised in Pontiac, uh, Hank was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi, but moved with the family in the Great Migration when he was two to Pontiac. And the other brothers, Thad and Elvin, were born here. And they all came up on the scene here. That is the Jones brothers. That is the most influential family in jazz history, I think. I think it's the, it's the if you look at the individual, uh, um, um, the way those three impacted uh, their instruments, uh, and in Thad's case, as a composer, arranger, and big band leader, um, uh, there is not another family in jazz, I think, that that can compare to them. And we have a lot of great families in jazz, right? The West Montgomery, the Montgomery brothers out of Indianapolis, and the Heath brothers from um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Philadelphia, and the Marcellus family from uh, New Orleans. There are a lot of jazz families, but uh, I don't think anyone compares uh, to the impact that Thad, Hank, and Elvin had. Um, now, beyond that, we've had some other important families here in Detroit. Um, the uh, um, uh, the question referenced the the Henderson brothers. Joe Henderson um, is a uh, you know in the pantheon um, uh, of jazz greats as a tenor saxophonist who came up here uh, in the 1950s, went to Wayne State. Um, I was born in Ohio, but then went to Wayne State and really came of age here on the scene as part of our scene here, studied with Barry Harris, and then becomes a hugely influential figure uh, in New York in the 1960s and 70s. Any, I mean, you go here, any tenor player today uh, it, uh, across the planet playing modern jazz, you're going to hear a little bit of Joe Henderson in there somewhere. Um, but Joe had a younger brother whose name was Leon Henderson, who also played tenor saxophone, who never got famous uh, internationally uh, as his brother Joe did. But uh, Leon uh, was a very important player here on the Detroit scene uh, in the 1960, or late 1960s and through the 1970s, um, playing tenor with a, um, a progressive band in Detroit called the Contemporary Jazz Quintet, which in its day, um, in the late 60s and early 70s was the most progressive uh, um, and uh, vital modern jazz band in Detroit. In fact, they made two records uh, for Blue Note in 1969 and 1970 that you can go, uh, you can hear and you can um, see what they were up to. And Leon Henderson, uh, interestingly enough, when you listen to him play, does not play like his brother Joe. He actually is sort of much more influenced by um, Wayne Shorter, who in that in the sixties was playing with Miles Davis. Um, so um, uh, Leon, unfortunately, um, was uh, had pretty severe mental illness, and by the late seventies, early eighties, uh, uh, after the early eighties, he's not playing anymore. Um, I came here in nineteen ninety six. I'm sorry, in nineteen ninety five. I never heard Leon Anderson play live. I never even met him. Um, and even folks who knew him very, very well um, sort of lost contact with him. Um, so it's a it's a shame, tragic story. He's uh, uh, died not not so many years ago. And in fact, he is buried in Plymouth, which is uh, which is where I live. Uh, he's buried not all that far from where I live. So uh, so the Hendersons are an important family. The other really important family here in Detroit is the McKinney family. Um, Harold McKinney uh, was a pianist and a, and a mentor for multiple generations of Detroiters here. His brother Ray uh, was an important bass player um, uh, who made some records with uh, Yusuf Latif and spent a little bit of time in New York. And uh, another brother, uh, Kiani Zawadi, um, is a, uh, uh, um, a trombone player and a euphonium player, made some uh, uh, high, high uh, profile records in, uh, in New York. Um, the younger generation, uh, Harold's uh, daughter, Galen McKinney, is a drummer who was uh, uh, Aretha Franklin's last drummer, very uh, uh, great jazz drummer, an important force on the, the local scene here. And as I said, played with Aretha in, in the last, say, five years or so of Aretha's life. Um, the producer, uh, pianist producer, uh, Carlos McKinney, um, is a uh, a nephew to uh, Harold, he uh, a Grammy winner, uh, um, a uh, um, hip hop producer, soul producer, and the like. Uh, so that family has had a um, a big impact. I think you see families like that um, 
uh, in in most major cities. You know, the music. Um, you know, when you grow up in the, in that environment around the music, it's it's very powerful, um, and you um, you assimilate a lot of stuff. You're hearing music all the time. You know, it's 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 not uncommon. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the musicians that um, uh, uh, contemporary musicians that are in the book had stories of fathers who were, if they weren't musician professional musicians, they were um, serious fans. They had big record collections and they revered the music. And their sons grew up watching them revere the music. Um, Bob Hurst's father um, loved the modern jazz quartet. Loved Miles Davis. Um, Kareem Riggins, very important young drummer. Um, uh, in, on today's contemporary scene, um, has a straight ahead jazz career with people like uh, Ray Brown and, and Diana Krall. Uh, on the other hand, um, he's a hip hop producer and works with worked with Jay Dilla before Jay Dilla died and work, uh, works and produces for Kanye West and for Common and all of these folks. Well, Kareem's father was a pianist and made records for uh, Blue Note Records uh, with Grant Green, the guitarist in the 1970s. And Kareem, so Kareem grew up around that music. And in fact, um, Kareem's primary mentor was Marcus Belgrave and Marcus Belgrave worked with Kareem's father. And the first time Kareem played the drums, it was over at Marcus's house where he was there with his father at a rehearsal. So, you know, these kinds of uh, family community connections are, um, are important. And I'll say just uh, uh, one more quick thing on that, just on this community connections thing. You know, everybody in Detroit has a story about, um, you know, well, I grew up in two houses down, one of the, um, you know, one of the Supremes lived, or one of the Temptations lived across the hall from my aunt. And I used to see people going in and out of the apartment, or, you know, um, Oh, my, you know, my aunt worked at Motown as a secretary and uh, the, all of these um, connections are, are musical connections are really palpable here. You know, when you go hear jazz in Detroit, it's it's special because you're in an audience that's very aware of the music and you're sitting there. Uh, you know, when I first got here, I'd go hear Tommy Flanagan play and Tommy's brothers were in the audience or I'd hear Milt play, Milt Jackson play and his older brother Wilbur was in the audience. Um, and so are there people that went to school with these people um, all those years ago? And so it's um, it's, it's a family atmosphere here that's, I think, a community atmosphere that's very important to the passing on of the legacy. You feel that when you're here. Mark, you've touched on this a little bit um, over the last few minutes, but could you mention some of the kind of strong musicians coming out of Detroit today um, and also Kind of in relation to that, do you have any picks for the upcoming jazz festival that folks should go and see? Um, well, I I tell you there are um, there are a lot of great young musicians uh, here. They it just they keep coming and coming and coming and coming. Um, uh, I'll mention three. Um, uh, Marcus Elliott is a, a young, I say young now that everybody's young to me now, but um, these are all folks that are now uh, in their 30s um, and kids that I've been watching now for 10, 15 years as they've sort of grown up uh, uh, here on the scene. Um, but Marcus Elliott, a young saxophone player, uh, is a, a very soulful musician, um, has um, not a flashy player, um, but but very soulful. And uh, I tell you, there's that, you know, any any scene around the country, including New York, would be glad to have Marcus here. Uh, Ian Finkelstein, uh, young pianist, studied at, at the University of Michigan with Jerry Allen. Um, and uh, uh, and he is a um, very creative player, uh, is active both in jazz, straight ahead jazz. Um, and he plays with Bob Hurst, his, one of his teachers from the University of Michigan. Um, and he uh, is also very active in um, uh, electronic music and is traveling all over the world with different, um, you know, important people in that world, uh, but is still based here. Um, and Nate Wynn, who's a great, great drummer um, who uh, uh, grew up here and is a guy that can play any, any style. He swings. He's very creative. Uh, I've heard him play with uh, big bands. I heard him play with Pat Metheny. 
uh, in a small trio in a ja small jazz club setting. Fantastic, um, great musician, great spirit. Um, and, and I could go on. I mean, they're like a lot of guys um, that and 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 young women uh, who can really really play here. Um, and uh, it's very rewarding. Uh, you know, I will and I will mention. Uh, um, speaking of young women, um, the bass player and Dia Owens, uh, who might not be a familiar name to people, but anybody who watches uh, the late show with Stephen Colbert and it sees that African-American woman playing the bass with sort of real tall hair um, every time that when they flash over to the band, um, she's been a member that that's India Owens from Detroit who grew up here. Uh, came up under one of the last kids to sort of come up under Marcus Belgrade, studied at the University at Michigan State with Rodney Whitaker, um, studied at Juilliard uh, with Ron Carter, the former Detroiter, and now is having, um, you know, an emerging big career. She's on television every night in John Batista's band uh, on, um, on the show. So, um, you know, that's an example. I mean, we're still take we're still people are still coming out of here and having an impact on the national scene. And to that, on that score, um, as we're talking about the Detroit Jazz Festival, um, there are two, two things immediately come to mind with Detroit connections that people should look at. One is uh, Sunday night, um, uh, Charles McPherson, the great alto saxophonist who I mentioned is, was a student of Barry Harris's. Charles is uh, uh, in his early 80s and is still playing as great as ever. And he's playing uh, um, a Sunday night uh, with a band, uh, including some New Yorkers, as well as uh, Rodney Whitaker, the bass player from here. So uh, that's one thing that shows you the, you know, the elder statesman generation. And then one of the most important contemporary saxophone players on the scene, he's in his 40s now, his name is um, J.D. Allen. Uh, and J.D. is playing uh, on uh, he's a kid that left here pretty early uh, when he was 18 or 19 and really has not come back but his early days was all he was one of those Detroit kids coming up with a bunch of other Detroit kids that have now gone on to have nice careers and and JD is one of the most important um, and he's playing with his trio on Monday I don't remember the exact time but it's uh, I think it's late afternoon so those are two things I would think about for people with Detroit Connections. Mark, you mentioned um, seemingly so many people having different personal connections to the Detroit jazz scene, and I wanted to share a couple comments we've actually gotten from audience members. Mm -hmm. uh, Javon Jordan, who says, I was the paper boy on the block that Edie Kendricks lived. And then Calvin Neal says, I'm from Pontiac, and my mother and uncles grew up with Thad and Elvin, and my uncle even attended the jam sessions at the Jones home. Boy, those are, um, you know, I wish that that uncle is someone I would like to talk to to see what those were, those were like. Um, and um, and I would just uh, uh, j just make a very quick plug for Jamon Jordan who asked who made that other comment. John Jamon is a um, incredibly insightful um, uh, historian about uh, uh, African American history in Detroit. He's teaching um, through the University of Michigan now a, a course. Um, on Detroit history, and he gives tours. Black Squirrel Tours uh, is his uh, is his uh, a business, and I, it's something I would encourage uh, anybody that's listening should really look at. It's an extraordinarily valuable uh, thing to do, and would create context uh, to help you even understand uh, what's in my book, um, uh, you know, in greater depth. And Jermon is someone who we turn to. He's in our uh, uh, in the documentary that I'm co-producing based on the book uh, because his uh, he's so um, um, so important, I think, in, in creating that context for people. Well, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So I wanted to turn to one last question for you, Mark, and that's what are you reading lately? Um, I came prepared. Uh, I have two books on my bed's uh, nightstand. And the first is um, Heart Full of Rhythm, uh, which is, uh, uh, about uh, the big band years of Louis Armstrong uh, by uh, the, our most important Armstrong scholar named Ricky Riccardi. And it focuses on uh, uh, Louis's years from 1927 or so up until about 1947 or so. Um, and these are years that uh, for many, uh, for a long time, jazz critics saw these uh, as um, 
commer very commercial years for Louis Armstrong and the music he was making not as important or valuable as the uh, his music of the 1920s, which in many respects um, helped essentially create the genre uh, and the improvised solo, the genre of jazz as we know it. And Ricky is a revisionist to the extent that he is arguing uh, that, our, you, that we need to understand Armstrong in a different way to understand what was happening in these years. And if um, uh, if you take a too purist of a view, you're going to miss um, the um, the real artistry of of Louis Armstrong in 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 these years. And um, uh, and he's a good stylist, uh, a pro stylist, Ricky is. So um, I uh, um, I've very much been enjoying this book. And I think I've got something else here, but that's enough. Um, I, I highly recommend this. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Mark. Um, where should folks go if they want to kind of learn about your most recent projects, learn more about the book, all that good stuff? I have a website, jazzfromdetroit.com. Uh, um, and uh, um, and you can, um, uh, so you can, you can see stuff there. Um, and uh, I write a monthly column for Jazz Times magazine. Uh, you can check their website, jazztimes.com. You could also uh, pick up the magazine on the uh, um, uh, on the newsstands uh, and the book itself. Uh, let's uh, everybody should remember that the University of Michigan Press is running a special uh, for the month of August. So you got another day. You got tonight, tomorrow, but it's only twenty bucks um, if you order through U of M Press. Uh, 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 you can uh, do a Google search and you'll come up with it. Um, and uh, not only is it for sale for $20, which is half price, uh, it's free shipping for the month. So uh, it's the best deal, uh, best deal around that, that there is. If for some reason uh, you can't do it this time around, um, you know, if you're in uh, Ann Arbor, uh, Literati uh, has the book uh, and the other independent bookstores have it uh, in Detroit. Source Booksellers has it in uh, Greenfield. Uh, I'm sorry, in uh, um, Oak Park. Um, Bookbeat has it. Um, and you can always go back to U of M Press and you can also go to that other online retailer. I can't remember their name. Um, they're the little guy, but you can find it there, too. You're making my job easy, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, again, the uh, book is on sale for $20 with free shipping through the end of this month. The code to use at the University of Michigan website is UMGL20JAZZ. So just go to the University of Michigan Press website, search for Mark's book, and use that code at checkout. You've just posted it in chat and it'll be on Facebook as well. Thank you so much again, Mark, for being with us. Thank you everyone for attending um, and have a wonderful evening. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good night, everyone.